Hi, I'm James from Chaosium. I sat down with John Wick, who is the creative director of 7th Sea, and we talked about world building. I asked John if it was possible to do too much world building, and he shared all of his thoughts on the matter. I'll jump across to the interview in just a moment, but first, please remember to subscribe, and thanks for watching. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I have a, when I do game design seminars, I like telling people, if it's not on the character sheet, it's not real. Uh, and the best example is when Jess Hennig is working on Mage. Uh, he added resonance to the character sheet for like the second edition revised or whatever it was. And people came to him and said, hey, I love this new mechanic called resonance. And Jess is like, it was in first edition. It just wasn't on the character sheet. And so the same thing is if there is... If you're world building and doing stuff that your players are never going to see, why are you doing it? Sure, it's fun to world build, right? But when you think of how are the players going to interact with this, which is what you should always be thinking in world building, is how are the players going to interact with this? As a matter of fact, I would make the argument that that question is just as important, if not more important, than does this make sense? I would totally agree with that. I think that you want to put the player experience at the very forefront. But if you'll forgive me for throwing back a fairly obvious point in your face, what do you do then if you start to, well, what's it, what does it mean when you fall into a game where the GM is throwing an amazing amount of lore at you and forcing you to interact with all these little bits? It's too much. Or if you look at your character sheet and you have six different sections that really don't mean anything to you. Well, when uh, I was working on Legend of the Five Rings, there came a time when the world lore was so cumbersome. I was making the argument that we should stop and either move back in time or forward in time a thousand years and start over. Because that was the chief complaint that people had about Legend of the Five Rings is the world lore is too dense. It, there's too much of it. There's too much you need to learn to, you know, to to keep up. And for me, the, the that seemed like the obvious choice because when you get the L5R rule book, there's six clans, seven, there's seven clans. Uh, and that's really all you need to know. There's, And then we peppered it with little details, like little things that, that the Rokugan people did, uh, the ways that their culture was different than ours. But we didn't make it this vast encyclopedia of, you know, here's everything you need to know to appreciate your character. Uh, no. I don't want, this is a game, it's fun, and I don't want to do homework to play my game. Now, there are games where people, like, that is why they're there, right? There, there are people who are like, I am interested in world lore, and I will just sit down and, and read world lore all the time. That's great. That's another flavor of ice cream. But from my own philosophy, from my own what I like in a game... I want to be able to read something very quickly and be able to play. And then if I'm hooked, then I can start reading things and I can start studying the history of the Scorpion clan and how all of that affects my character. And, you know, in a nutshell, I shouldn't have to be a civil war historian to play a 20th century North American character. So let's say that you are writing your own setting or GMing your own setting. And I'm, I'm drawing a distinction between those two for this question and playing in a setting. What is the balance there? At what points do you think you've, you've gone too far? Is there any quick tips that you can provide people in these situations with that will let them figure out how to hit that sweet spot? I always like saying three things. Um, there are three things that are true about my character. There are three things that are true about my culture. There are three things I am. How, how do I look? Tell me three things. It's a nice little number. 
um it it gives it it allows you to do um uh something akin to uh uh what is it called triangulation it's like there's this thing and then there's this thing and then there's this third thing and all of those now make you know a shape right and so that's kind of how I do it when I run games. Uh, a couple of my games have been uh, very player player fronted so that the players can spend points and say things are true about the world. And generally I, what I do is I, 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 you can say three things are true about a thing and then that thing is set, move on. Uh, when it starts getting cumbersome again is... Well, when it, when it stops being useful is when it starts getting cumbersome. Because now, instead of, like, really obscure archery rules or really obscure, like, does chain mail protect you more against bashing weapons than plate mail? And, and okay, we have to stop and look it up for rules. Now we have to stop and look it up for world building. And both of those, both of those instances are things that stop play everyone pulls out their iphone and you're disengaged so you talked about different flavors of ice cream a little bit earlier when you were giving the analogy of people who might like to dive into these very law rich settings if you are playing in a game that is still fundamentally something that you enjoy so it's your flavor of ice cream what is the example of the heaviest law that you can think of what is the most thoroughly world-built setting with the most front-end information that still to you hits the spot that you like from a design perspective for me it's it's l5r and 7c because those games are about world building they're about okay what if you know let's do lord of the rings is to europe as Rokugan is to Japan. It's a fantastical thing built on mythology and not history. And then 7C went deeper than that. And so 7C is really like can teeter in that way. It can teeter in the, oh, but it has the advantage of you're from Montaigne. Oh, well, what is that? It's France. Oh, okay. I I, I know how I, I can do that, right? And and that was the, the gimmick that we had with 7C is that you can play a Montaigne character. Just like watch the Three Musketeers, any any version, and you've got a Montaigne character because Montaigne is Alexander Dumas, France. And so you just you just do that and you're in. Uh, you know, if you and and if that's all you want to do is 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 just play D'Artagnan, who knows nothing, and he's going around and getting in duels everywhere, you can do that. Or if you want to play a character who really knows the world and, and is like deep into the lore, you can do that too. I think that I think the line that I try to in when, when I have a big lore player, I think the line is when I want you to use the lore to make your character richer. So that other players, so you're using your knowledge of the lore. If, if let's use let's use L5R as an example, or we can use actually we can use RuneQuest as an example. I am a huge lunar fan. I am a huge fan of the Red Goddess, and I have all kinds of you know lore about the Red Goddess. But I would never tell another player you can't play that way because of this lore. I would never do that. Instead, I would use the lore to inform my play. And then let that kind of seep out to the other players to encourage them to learn more about Orland, Thor, Sartar, or anything like that. So taking the flip side approach for a second, what's too little? What's a game system or a game style that you found yourself frustrated in because you don't have that grounding? There's not enough to go with. Um, well, it's it's when that you just kind of nailed it on the head by saying, I don't know what to do. It's one of the big things about, about role-playing game design. It's one of the big questions that people generally don't ask themselves when they start writing a role-playing game, which is, okay, what's the first adventure? It's like you can base a role-playing game 
off of Alan Moore's Promethea comic, which I have like all the collector's editions and everything. I would never make a Promethea comic or a role-playing game because I don't know what you do. I don't know what the first adventure is. Actually, now that I think about it, I know what the first adventure is. <laughs> but, you know, things like that, right? Um, oh, uh, 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 the Black God's Kiss is a C.L. Moore book. Beautiful, fantastic, classic fantasy adventure book. I'm not, I don't know what you do with it other than play the main character going through the story. Because the world lore isn't isn't there to back up anything other than what is already supporting the story. I have a question now that is a pretty broad topic. Maybe we could talk about this specifically at some other point. But when you are world building for a tabletop role playing game, how does the work you do or the kind of content you create differ from if you're world building for any other medium, you know, a novel, TV series. Uh... Well, it's funny because one of the things I was telling my partner, Jessica, at, when I was in the middle of one of the Seventh Sea novels, I said, this is so easy because I never have to stop and ask, how are the players going to use this? And that that really is what it comes down to. There is an interaction with the setting in a role-playing game that not even video games have. Not even like video games don't have it. Novels don't have it. Like no other medium has it. I can be in the world of Narnia and I can talk to the white queen. I mean, I wouldn't want to be in that situation, but you know, there it is, right? You can't do that in the movie. You can't step into the movie and go, hey, get over Edward. Uh, hey, but white queen, t pick me instead. I love, I, I, I love those little candies you got. Just, just let's go, right? You can't do that. So in a role playing game, the difference between world building is how is the how are the players going to interact with it, as opposed to how are the players going to perceive it, which is entirely different. Perfect. Well, we've gone into world building, I think, at a, at a, at a basic level, and we might return to it again. But for now, do you have any final thoughts, any sort of crystallized points you'd like to make about what the right amount of world building is when you're diving into a TTRPG? I think that that just like you can overspice a meal, you can over you can overdo world building. You can make it so that and what's more is that because gamers are our kind of own ecology um there is a lot of intentional and unintentional gatekeeping when it comes to settings and this is because players love settings players don't love rules like nobody cares about the archery mechanic but they love ravenloft they love dragonlance they love glorantha they love you know Rokugan and that's what they get emotionally invested in and the temptation to overwhelm them with well here's more that you can get emotionally invested in then it becomes choice paralysis of oh where what do I do where do I go instead you give them little bits and and that's really all you need you don't need a lot of salt on your eggs you just need a little bit and it makes and it makes every, the whole difference. And but when you like take the entire salt canister and just empty it on a fried egg, then, then you don't you don't taste the egg anymore. All you do is taste the salt.